Hello and most welcome to H905. We are on a stroll here and I think it's a good idea to do things before the sun goes down. And this park is actually closing at 6 o'clock. used to be a private park and that is the reason. But it's also there is a lot of exclusive plants here. One thing uh, I got to realize could, um, well I actually think it's an exclusive plant of sorts. Something that can grow with our understanding and to develop into something quite spectacular. Uh, and this is mostly thanks to Rudolf Gachet, also some drag force from dear old Robert Magliola, uh, whom I were in contact by reading his book already in the 90s, Derrida and the Mant. Uh, this author, oddly enough, I had a lot of contact with. So this is not a happenstance, not a lucky happenstance. But I always felt that was something in it. But there are different aspects that makes it not so accessible. And one is the odd purely, pu peculiarity of the language. It is not this flowing poetic language of neither Magliola nor uh, the one I really love uh, about Rudolf Cachet and not at all Derrida. Derrida is enticing, it's like bathing in a nice river, it always flows and there are new interesting turns that makes you excited and you know there is something new around the corner. No, the texts of this author are rather crude and uh, very logical and hmm, even me as an engineer and I used to study logic, uh, I feel it to be cumbersome sometimes. It's the style of writing. But the good thing I come to realize it is a gem. It is a fantastic plant. It's very, very parallel to deconstruction, but it sort of turn on itself reciprocally and it also reverses in a way that is exhilarating. So beyond the rather dry language, there is a well of wealth. And the author I'm speaking about is none other than uh, Tartan Tolko, whom I started to read uh, in the late 90s, 99 or the year 2000, something like that. And uh, we even had a study group for him that would continue for two years uh, with Stig Albansson and Håkan Olsson. <clears throat> get anywhere. Well we did, I think it's rather similar to what I mentioned earlier with the Heidegger lectures. Something entered and maybe my willingness or preemptive understanding stopped me to enter more into the text and I would say that could be a very common problem with his books. Uh, you get an idea early on what it is about, you get stuck in that, and then further read and reading becomes most difficult. But now all of a sudden it opens up, and that would be a very good thing because that is a wealth of written material from this Tartan Tolko. In this he calls the TSK series, there are at least eight rather heavy volumes, but he also has, have, uh, has other series that are quite expensive as well. And he written the book in the most peculiar manner. Uh, it's almost like ghost writing, but not. He has been working in cooperation uh, with uh, three or four co-authors who are not mentioned in the book. One is Jack Petranker, 
Uh, Jack Petranka is still alive and kicking, a very smart person. And I, I would think my idea is he's mostly responsible for this book. It's very philosophical in its wording and he has this engineer-like way of looking at things. But with the help of Derrida and Rodolphe Gachet, I am bringing some life to the text, make them a little bit more poetic. And all of a sudden they open up. And from have been in, uh, in uh, the position of meaning very little to nothing, they mean a lot now. They really make a difference. Uh, but before I dwell into a chapter of the book, let me just continue to sort of opening up, making a pre-randial drink. That's a drink before. Pre-prandial drink, it's a drink before dinner. And it's supposed to open up the appetite. And when it comes to Tartan Turku, I think a beverage of that sort is quite a necessity. We had uh, Dr. Pepper before here. Now I'm going to introduce you to a verbal drink, uh, which is, well, it's going to be a segue into the thinking of Tartan Turku. I was on the verge of mentioning this before, and uh, that was the second part on education. And there is, as I feel it, a taint of this horror vacui also in education. And I call this preamble, this preprandial drink. Another factor in education is fear. And that there is some sort of fear built into the system. I am not talking about a strong fear here rather uh, like a mild, mild stress or preoccupation of sorts. Over tensity, over concentration, too fixated in the presence part or the plus part or as Betty Edwards would say, most drawings mistakes are done because we press our attention too much to the positive part. For instance, if you're going to draw me, you focus too much in what is here instead of what is surrounding. If you take in the surrounding, it opens up and it becomes easier. And oddly enough, with uh, her most famous book and incredible bestseller, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, you can become a skilled drawer in only a couple of weeks. And these incredibly simple tricks are actually the same tricks, almost to the point that deconstruction uses. And in education, there is a need for deconstruction as well, I mean. It means that we should not be too focused on the presence in detail, not too focused into what is knowledge and allow a little bit of the things that are not knowledge. The chapter I'm going to read later is about memory and the problems that can erupt with memory if we focus too much on the positive details. And that those positive details could be things that actually happen. In contrast to what is called with a scientific name, confabulations. And of course, within education, that distinction is way too sharp. And confabulation, making up things that sounds like memory, but are not only right memory, are only allowed in a small part of uh, the maternal language, Swedish literature, when you write a little essay of some sort, making things up. I think allowing more fantasy and more things that are made up would make it much more possible to enter what is really important as well. And in contrast to what I think is the gestalt of 
the, the current philosophers of education that allowing fantasy and imagination would discard fact knowing I think is just the opposite it makes knowledge more spacious less constricted and delineated it makes knowledge more allowing to come in and it's exactly the thing with memory once I really try to remember something is it a true memory this is the very point when it gets incredibly hard to remember and since memory is such a big problem today almost unsurmountable problem we all forget and the apps the things for the mobile to help us forget they don't seem to help well in my case they haven't helped much I constantly get reminder on the mobile but still I forget and why wasn't this the case for my grandparents the normal answer is oh today we have too much information I think that's partly right but I don't think that is the whole picture maybe this too much information is too much delineation and once the delineations gets too massive too many it is in itself a mess inside our thinking it becomes muddled unclear muddy water and how is it to swim under underneath the surface in muddy water it's very tough it's very tough so I think a person that well writes in a way that could be the journal of a doctor or even worse a police report it is giving loads of valuable points it just needs a little bit of decorum decoration to make it more digestible or as my grandmother used to say with a little sugar the medicine would come down we need that extra the addendum because that is an invitation to fantasy and sweeter understanding sweeten the thing up a bit it doesn't have to be the harshest thing and this is also a way I would say sounding like, like an educationalist here but once you learn to sweeten things up yourself you will be able to approach hard texts easier because you are doing the sweetening yourself they won't look as threatening or uh, scary like a mathematic uh, text or, or sort of loads of equation that look too cold that blocks out learning it's a very common uh, problem in mathematics and I think that makes people shy away from mathematics and logic by learning how to sweeten up things and see that you yourself can delve into the, to the text and make it more interesting uh, there is actually a book produced that does that in mathematics where you sort of imagine the numbers to be more vivid looking like animals I think number six was a zebra number nine was a giraffe and that in itself makes it easier more flexible more open and this book despite its not very appetizing format well the size in itself is scary it's even too big to put under your head if you do a constructive rest it is a gem hidden beneath there are fantastic ideas new ways of seeing things and it's a creative process as well as a path into creativity and what could be more valuable than that I think it could be a, a sort of a diamond or a brilliant because many of the 
very odd pictures do look like brilliance. I will read this chapter a bit short. It's called The Compelling Flow of Time and is found on page 121 in the book. And this poetic nature in the beginning is going to help you maybe put you into an encompassing bodily, emotional, effective way. Coming from where, depending on when, transported through what connections which sequence how empowered the difficulties with the linear flow of time seem closely tied to the view that polar knowledge is momentary when we speak about polar knowledge is the self or the ego has its objects. I mentioned that uh, before and that constructs sort of a pointy consciousness. A pointy consciousness that delineates the moment and makes, makes it shielded to the moment that comes next, the future, but also shield to the past moment. The thing that happened. Accordingly, it has sometimes been suggested that time is not momentary in structure, that the present is somehow broad enough to encompass more than one moment. But even assuming this approach does not create more problems than it solves. The movement of time from past to present to future remains a necessi necessary, necessary prerequisite for the conventional order to establish itself. If we set aside for now the problems that arise in the linking together of separate moments, how does the more fundamental structure of a linear temporal flow from the past to future fair under analysis and this is very typical from this book there is a sort of introductory part and then comes an analysis and then the an analysis I have to sweeten up a bit I will use Derrida and Rudolf Gachet for that it's called a bit strict and called a linear unfolding. When something appears, where does it come from? Conventional understanding based on temporal knowledge answer, answer that present appearance depends on the past. Each moment, even in the broad sense in which the moment encompasses more than an instant, arises from the preceding moment. What ex whatever exists now traces its origins to events occurring earlier in time. And here, oddly enough, I don't even have to use my imagination. Uh, Jack Petrenker slash Tartan Turko uses the word trace and it's almost to the point the same as the Derridian trace. That the present has trace of the past. This is a different approach to difference, where uh, the earlier movement has a difference to the present movement, which has a difference to the, uh, the next movement, the succeeding movement. Here instead, look at it as a trace, some remnants, and this could also be memory. And the lovely thing with trace, it doesn't exactly say what the trace is. It is something from the past, but not anything specific. While this may sound, hmm, maybe a bit undecided and unclear, it is actually just the opposite. 
because leaving it as a trace means an opening. And this is also how it used in Derid Deridian deconstruction, especially looking at Saussure, how the difference leaves a trace in both sides, both the signed and the sign signified. So signified. <laughs> Sorry, my tongue stumbles. This is the third lecture in the row. Let me go back to the text. Whatever exists now traces its origins to events occurring early in time. And early in time is in citation mark. Even a stable object, such as, as a mountain, exists on the basis of having been formed over a million years ago. On a more tightly focused view, the mountain exists in this moment on the basis of having existed in the moment just before. Zenon's paradox once more. Yet how can the past hold such a wealth of possibilities? Does each earlier moment already encompass within it the potential for all succeeding moments of time? Did the first moment contain within it some unexpressed form of everything that has ever happened and will ever happen? Causal determinism of any kind seems to point in this direction. And this is sort of either very narrow take on the idea of the very first moment, the Big Bang of moments. And presently, we often hear that within the Big Bang, all succeeding moments were contained. And first look at that will point to sort of determinism that if you look at the trace, you see start to see a most interesting connection where it doesn't just go from the past to the future. It seems uh, that in the pretension, the sort of onward thrust into the future, there is already trace of the future, oddly enough. It has, sometimes I get the feeling it has a directedness. So it is not unilateral going one way, it could also go the other way. And this is one of those things that are so hard to understand in the Redian deconstruction. Maybe only for me, but I don't think so. I've been visiting forums for a long time and defer seem for some reason which is in time, be more difficult to get a grip on than difference. Be different. Defer, be absent in time. It is so much harder for some reason to reverse the temporal successions of moments. It seems so obvious that everything goes from the past exclusively. To the future. The first little thing I'm going to uh, sweeten the whole idea uh, up a little bit is the Matrushka. And I can tell you, since we take time from space, and the Matrushka is space, space is interpenetrative, and that is halfway to reversal. Time is the same. Each moment, moment is in, interpenetrative in the way that it's not only the past that leaves a trace into the present. Also the present puts a trace on the past. Because the past moments, we look at them from a point of view of the present. We cannot both be in the present and look at the present. 
So there is something that needs to be softened up here. And of course it's the paradox of Xenon, but I prefer this take. It's more open-ended. And open-ends usually leads to deepening of understanding. Let me continue for a while here. Bear with me. If the first moment of time did contain all succeeding moments in some in choked form, if it's contained form, a whole series of fundamental questions would arise. What makes linear time unfold as it does? Important question. Why should there even be a first moment? Where does that stem from? Where is that decided? And why should its potential contents, the entire range of events in time, come into being in sequence, rather than all at once or in some different order? And now we're getting into sequences. And I think that halfway in understanding so to speak, reversal of time, because it's, it's not completely correct to say reversal. We are always deciding the sequences in the present moment, and that is a, sort of a problem for this uh, established order of moments. I, when I look back, I order everything in a sequence, and I do it in the present moment. And I also do it towards the future, because otherwise it wouldn't work. I need the future, because while I'm doing the sequences, I'm already, already passing into the future. What factor brings the flow of time into being at all? What purpose does it satisfy? What motive does it fulfill? Does it make sense to speak of motives or purposes existing prior to time or beyond it? Or do such, such notions only reveal the limits of time-bound linear thinking? And once more we are back to Edmund Husserl's pretension and retention because since he wouldn't accept the point like no idea because he felt it to be too crude, too shallow, too flat to encompass the dimensional foe, idea or conception of time, pretension has also a little flavor of intention because you intend the future you do the future it's an active ingredient here in the start when I uh, read this it sounded almost this is completely passive in a way or I'm an onlooker to this taking place of ordering and sequences but I'm an active participant in the sequence. And I start thinking about some languages, for instance, Chinese, where it used to be the case, when you read the language, you decided in what order you took the signs to be read. Either from the most usual, going from the above to the below, or the second most usual from the right to the left, but also from the left to the right, and actually some cases from below to up. So even this linearity in text can be looked at differently. And sometimes, and this is almost scary complicated, both readings are correct, both from right to left or left to right and they give different meanings, or both meanings at the same time. I have even heard of texts that are quadratical, 
so you can read them below to up and up to down from left to right and right to left and you understand the whole text at once or in different linearities so you see in, even in texts there can be deconstruction of sorts and the more you train that you more the more you open up possibilities and in this process there is actually more potentials more both for more precision and for broadness it's the limitation that makes the crudeness it was also the limitation in the previous text we have the text before her from Derrida about friends also in that text we noticed from that very crude start that the saying only meant that if you have old friends you have no friends it turned out to be much deeper and having more power of saying things instead of something completely shallow something that you more or less spit out of your mouth when you you enter the tram or you're in a rush just to mention something without meaning anything specific specifically it can deepen and become wider and more telling and that's the power of intention and the same goes for memory I feel it myself when I start to think of memory of going both ways. All of a sudden I already feel a sharpness of my capability to enter into memory and enter into past. It is not that shelled off from me anymore. It becomes something I can reach into and what is the reason for that the reason is I broaden the entryway the door becomes wider and wider and it is only the fear the fear I mentioned earlier this uncalled for fear that stops me from making the broadly for instance when I stand here it could be the fear of disappearing that makes me narrow my existence in space not taking in my behind and I also mentioned the sports arena we have behind us here I took that away possibly because it looks it doesn't look that nice to be honest but that is also place takes place in my space and by allowing that, I also allow myself to exist more. Instead of eradicating or casting away absence, invite, invite it to be present. And you will notice also the present becomes more accessible. The point here is how we sort of have a gestalt of the past will affect also the memory situation and once you make memories of the past moment shelled off and ruled by this passive system of sequences they automatically become passive and obscured but by letting intention coming in so keenly put to words by Edmund Hussell with almost this willingness to future and also actively participating in one's own very past. A past that also can be seen in the wordings uh, of Aristotle because it's in his memories where this friendship have occurred. And you can see all of a sudden it becomes more vivid, living, and accessible in, at the very same time and that in itself is the energy that brings memory to place and you don't have to come looking for the memory 
it comes easily to you because he's no longer way back there in this long colon of successive moment. That is a gestalt by definition, by its very force, make memories so far away. When I read this the first time, I started thinking about dementia. Dementia is taking away of this process, which is a disaster. But oddly enough, and I think this is a clue, people with dementia can have very clear memories. So you see, actually disability brings memory to place. And that goes to show that there's something we put in ourselves that obscures memories. And that means by a clearer and sharper understanding we can get close to our own memories. We don't have to wait for disability or drunkenness or whatever it can be. By widening the Gestalt we reach our memories. I will tell you more about interesting things from neurology, neurology connected to this. But it seems we're ending of time here. It's six o'clock and the park is closing. But I say thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I think this is a gem. Bye bye for now.